You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The new year is the perfect time to start building credit scores, because when your credit scores increase, your opportunities do too, like possible loan approvals and lower interest rates. Chime makes it easier to help build your credit with a secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. You can use Credit Builder everywhere Visa credit cards are accepted. Chime helps you build your credit scores safely by using your own money to make everyday purchases and on-time payments. To apply, just open a Chime checking account with a $200 qualifying direct deposit. And don't stress, there's no annual fee or credit check required to apply and get started. Start building your credit history and finding new opportunities with a secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Get started today at Chime.com slash build. That's Chime.com slash build. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. members FDIC. Late payment may negatively impact your credit score. Results may vary. Freedom is all about choices. And while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xe, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Hello, everyone, and welcome. The History of the Great War premium episode number 17. Now, if you are listening to this from the normal History of the Great War feed, please do not adjust your antenna. This is a special preview episode of what you can find on the Patreon feed by supporting the podcast. This is the first episode and introduction, really, to a five-episode series that will play out over the coming months for Patreon subscribers. This series will focus on one very important topic, military doctrine, and especially how it changed during the war. At the start of the war, Germany, France, and Great Britain all went to war with roughly the same doctrine. All of those countries had studied the wars of the late 19th century and had all drawn surprisingly similar conclusions. They also shared another similarity. None of them had greatly changed their training manuals for about 50 years, or at the very least since the Franco-Prussian War. They had massaged them, perhaps changed some of the emphasis, but they remained largely the same. This would put all three countries at a disadvantage when the war started, and I believe that their performance is better predicted by their chosen role in the war rather than what their army's doctrine actually was. During this episode, we will discuss how these countries came to form their military beliefs, the problems that they would soon need to solve, and how they tried to solve them. We will then look at what they needed to do to solve some of the tactical problems in front of them, especially around launching successful offensive operations on the Western Front even if they themselves did not know what those were at the time. We will then close out this episode by looking ahead and roughly mapping out what the next four Patreon episodes will look like as we dive much, much deeper into these topics. Way back in the first few episodes of the podcast, we discussed briefly how all the countries thought they would be fighting the war once it started. Then over the course of the Patreon episodes discussing the uses of cavalry and tanks, we discussed these ideas quite a bit more. Because of this, I won't spend too much time today on the subject, but I thought it would be good to give a bit of a summary. When Europeans looked at previous wars, they focused quite rightly on recent conflicts that were close to home. And for Europeans, this meant they placed a lot of emphasis on the Austro-Prussian War of 1866 and the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Both of these wars, but especially the latter, would dominate the planning and practicing that the armies of Europe would do for the next war, and there was no countries where this was more true than France and Germany. We will dive a bit deeper into precisely how this affected both countries and their militaries, but in both cases, the military leadership drew some wrong lessons from these wars. For the Prussians, it made them believe that their speed of mobilization, deployment, and how fast they could launch their first attack was the most critical component of successfully launching an offensive campaign, because it had been in 1870, and this would drive their actions in 1914. For the French, it was much the same. They believed, after a decade or so detour into more defensive-minded strategies, that they had to attack and attack quickly. However, one of the more abstract ideas that the two wars perpetuated, and there would be nothing to dispel these thoughts, had little to do with actions on the battlefield, and far more to do with strategic and political maneuvering. 
on both sides of the Franco-German border. Military leaders did not see wars and their war plans as a ways to execute some set of political objectives. If they did, then there would have been multiple different plans for different situations and goals. Instead, both of them only had one plan to be used regardless of the situation. This fact was due to the belief that if the military could win a big sweeping war against their enemies in these giant battles of annihilation, which they would of course win, of course, then any political considerations were irrelevant because the politicians could just sort things out over the smoldering corpse of their enemies. This belief can be seen in both the German move through Belgium, which was their only war plan, and the French thrust into Germany further south, once again their only war plan that they had for a war with Germany. There were just no contingency plans. We now move on to discussing some of the problems that these nations would face during the war. Without a doubt, the most enduring memory of the First World War is the trenches on the Western Front. Depictions of the battles that took place at places like Verdun, the Somme, Passchendaele, dominate the histories. All of these battles, and of course many more, all came about because of the deadlock that evolved in northern France and Belgium. It was truly a horrible experience for all involved, which of course leads to the next logical question. Was this situation inevitable, and could they have fixed it? Often the end result of these questions is to blame the generals. Why did they not see the problems? Why did they not have a solution? This is where there is serious danger of being blinded by hindsight. We know that by the end of the war, the French, British, and Germans were all capable of making great progress in their offensives. But the War of 1918 was very different than the War of 1914, and even 1915 and 1916. When the war started, few generals thought that the war would become a stalemate, and so they were almost completely unprepared for that eventuality. Beyond that, they were, they were flying by the seat of their pants on how to fix the problem. However, as we look back, the situation seems destined to just be as it was due to three critical problems that would turn the Western Front into the stalemate that it was. The first problem was the sheer size of the armies involved. Since their last test in 1870, the armies of both Germany and France had grown much larger in size by a factor of millions of men. This simply meant that when moving armies, there were more men to move, and there would be more men in their way to stop them. These larger numbers found themselves in something that did not change at all since 1870, the geography of Western Europe. Western Europe had been the stage of many wars and many battles, and in one very specific way it had not changed in millennia, it had not gotten any larger. The armies of Europe were like a child who was growing bigger but still wanted to sleep in their small infant bed. It just kept getting tighter and tighter, and no matter what they did, the bed wasn't going to get any bigger. To give an example of why this was problematic and why the Western Front was different than other fronts in the war, let's look at a single division on the Eastern and Western Fronts. In 1917, a German division on the Russian Front would occupy about 30 kilometers of the front, a pretty decent width, wider than some of the larger offensives in the West. However, in the West, that same division would occupy just 2.5 kilometers of front, less than one-tenth the space. The second primary issue revolved around firepower, which I think is the one that probably gets the most attention. With machine guns and artillery playing a larger role in the fighting, there were simply more bullets and shells on the battlefield. Now, this did not preclude offensive actions, especially in the minds of military leaders, who, before the war, many believed that this increase in firepower would give the attackers the same advantage as the defenders. While this was not to be a true statement, early in the war, um, by the end, it actually was true. The firepower greatly increased on both sides, the difference being that the attackers learned how to better use the firepower that they had available to them to launch offensive operations. Regardless of how much these problems changed the war, and how it was going to be fought, neither of them, either separate or together, would have caused the stalemate. The stalemate only resulted when you bring in the third and final problem, which was an acute lack of tactical mobility. Tactical mobility, or the mobility of units in the attack, was much the same as it had been a century before, or even a thousand years before, if you really want to stretch it. Throughout all of that time, the speed of the attack was the speed of a man on foot. However, during the previous century, strategic strategic mobility had seen a drastic increase. 
All of the armies of 1914 utilized railroads to allow them to move quantities of men and material that would have been unthinkable in earlier wars. This allowed them to reinforce and reposition their troops quickly and easily. When this strategic movement was combined with the relative lack of tactical mobility, it was impossible for an army to execute a strategic breakthrough, or really any real advance beyond the range of their artillery. This lack of mobility was a problem that would only be partially solved before the end of the war, and would only truly be solved in World War II and later. However, the tactical mobility was increased just enough to make later offensives work when combined with all the other realities of 1918. These three concepts, I think, encapsulate most of the issues that the World War I commanders were dealing with, and that they would either have to solve or just remain content with bludgeoning their armies to death against one another if they wanted to win the war. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild and style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. While the armies in the war never stopped actively trying to find new solutions to the problems in front of them, they are often criticized, or at least their commanders are, that they did not learn anything or they did not learn quick enough during the war. When you look at the period between 1915 and 1916, it's really easy to come to that conclusion. During these years, both the French and British repeatedly hurled themselves against the German lines. Each time they changed their plans and their tactics, generally by borrowing more artillery and more ammunition for that artillery onto the battlefield, however, it all seemed to be for naught since they were not getting the results that they expected. Unfortunately for the two armies, they were stuck in a loop that they could just not quite get ahead of. This was a phenomenon which we looked at during the 6th and 7th battles of the Asanzo in a recent mainline episode. The British and French would figure out a better way to do something in one attack, but before they could launch another attack and put this lesson to use, the Germans would introduce something that either countered or changed the situation enough that lessened the impact of it. This kept real progress just outside of French and British grasp, and it kept the Germans just one step ahead, at least for a while. They were benefited in this quest to stay one step ahead by a few wrong paths that their enemies traveled on on their way to success. I do want to point out that even though these attacks were in the classical sense failures, they did not reach their objectives, and they did not count as a win for the attackers, they were still having effects. The first of these was that the attacks were costing the Germans a lot of troops, and the prices paid in these early battles would come back to haunt the German army later on. The other effect these attacks had is that by the end of 1916, the British and French actually had a pretty good idea of what they were doing, and while they could still not break through the German lines, they were quite good at attacking, causing a number of German casualties roughly comparable to their own, and then capturing a bit of territory to go along with it. 
This was especially true for the French, and in many cases the British, after the bloody July on the Somme, which was a big problem, they were also able to sort of do these things. They were able to do this through proper coordination between their air forces, infantry, and artillery, which was, not, which was no longer a fluke and that they could replicate in each attack to capture a few German positions. Trying to push further was still mostly out of their grasp because they lacked the mobility to make it happen, but they could at least consistently take some ground and kill a lot of Germans, which is sort of the main point of a war. Of course, the Germans were not sitting on their hands, and what they saw this was happening, which resulted in their complete change in defensive tactics in the winter between 1916 and 1917. During this time, they changed from their previous tactics of strongly held front lines and instant counterattacks to a new elastic defensive method that spread out their strength and negated most of the tactical gains made by the French and British up to that point. Another often overlooked fact is that the French and British did not have a great place to try out new tactics and new ideas other than these large Western Front offensives that they could only launch a few times a year. The Germans would be constantly experimenting on the Russian and Italian fronts, giving them the ability to try out ideas without necessarily revealing them to their enemies. They could then bring what they learned back to France and Belgium for use on the primary front. There are, of course, a lot of other nuances that we will not go into right at this moment when it comes to what the armies learned during the war and how they used those lessons to adapt. We will instead hold off on those discussions until later. Of course, as we look back on the war, we not only have what the armies were thinking, learning, and doing, but we also have a pretty good idea of what they needed to do to solve some of their problems, information that they, of course, did not have. This meant that we have to be careful when judging the decision makers, since we are operating with far more information than they were. However, it does provide a good case study when it comes to how armies adapt in a complex, high-stress environment. It also provides fertile ground to look at how leaders adapt and change their assumptions and tendencies when they start off with many incorrect assumptions and must learn and integrate new ideas to try and move towards a doctrine that will eventually win their side in the conflict especially when these concepts that they have to learn go against generations of military thinking. The concepts that, looking back, seem to be critical for the armies in World War I are neatly outlined in Michael Hunzecker's excellent dissertation that is titled Perfecting War, the Organizational Sources of Doctrinal Optimization. In this work, he outlines three concepts. The first of these is assault tactics, and this means the irregular, dispersed formation of infantry that are trained and empowered to initiate small unit actions on their own. They would bypass strong points and push deep into enemy territory to disrupt the enemy's ability to respond. Now, this type of troop would become famous with the German stormtrooper, but it would be used by several armies during the war. But it is also the exact opposite of what the armies started with at the beginning, which were when they used large units in mass to try and break through enemy positions by sheer manpower. The second critical concept is combined arms. Here the armies had to find a way to not only use artillery, machine guns, infantry, airplanes, tanks, trench mortars, gas, and countless other weapon systems on the battlefield, but they also had to determine how to use them together to consistently produce maximum effect. And a lot of these wouldn't even exist before the war. The final concept was a better way of defending against the enemy, preferably an elastic depth in defense defense in depth. This meant arranging defenses in a pre-planned, pre-configured way in which they could absorb as much punishment as possible, both from the artillery and the infantry, and still bounce back in a controlled and precise manner. This was again very different than when the war started, at which point defenses were often ad hoc and very brittle, since most defenders manned the front lines and were very vulnerable to artillery. This was difficult to move away from, since defenses in depth required the defenders to willfully give up territory to the enemy, under the assumption that they would then regain it in future counterattacks, which meant breaking the bedrock belief for what men should do on the defensive before the war, which was hold every piece of ground to the last man. All three of these concepts would need to be discovered and perfected by each army, and at least they needed to become proficient enough to not let them pull down their other efforts. As it was, two of the three armies being discussed would have figured out most of this by the end of the war. 
So this has been a much longer introduction than I initially planned, but hopefully it provides some good bedrock for our discussions that will come next. Over the next three months, we will be taking each of the three Western Front armies in turn by looking at the French, then the Germans, and then the British Army. For each of these nations, we will attempt to answer three questions. First, how they came to their military doctrine with which they started the war. Second, how and why they changed these practices during the war. And then finally, we will take stock of where they were at the end of the war. We will then have a fourth episode where we will take a step back and do a bit of comparing and contrasting between the three armies. The final episode will also be an episode where I will answer any questions that anybody has about the items that we are discussing, or just in general about how the armies fought during the war. I'm quite excited for the next few Patreon episodes, and hope you are too, and I hope to have an episode on the French army released by the end of June. Thank you for listening, and if you enjoyed this episode, you can find more like it over at patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar.